Hello. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Alexis Petulis with Columbus, and today we have a special presentation for you on tax tools and tips for Microsoft Dynamics utilizing the cloud. We started the call by muting everyone, so if you have any questions during today's presentation, please use the question box feature on the right-hand side of the screen to ask any questions that may come up during our session. At the end, we'll have time for a Q&A with our presenter. Finally, we are recording the session and we'll be uploading it to our website and emailing to all attendees within 24 hours of this live webinar. And now I'm excited to introduce today's presenter, Stacy Dozy. Stacy is a Senior Strategic Alliance Manager at Avalara, working closely with top national partners. With over 20 years of experience in technology and software, primarily in the Microsoft ecosystem, she has considerable knowledge in business process, software application, and software deployment. She lives on a farm in Minnesota with her husband and three daughters. So without further ado, Stacy, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Alexis. And just a real quick, quick check, can you hear me okay? Yep, sound good. Wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you everyone for taking your, the time out of your day to come and sit through the webinar. We really appreciate it. Again, my name is Stacy Dozy, and I'm here at Avalara and I'm gonna try not to bore you too much as we talk about tax tools and tips, especially in the Microsoft space and utilizing the cloud and kind of what that means for your business. Um, really quickly, we'll just talk about the content or the agenda for today. We're going to do an introduction and overview, which is kind of what we're doing today, or we right now, excuse me. And part of that is also to explain and talk about this idea of and trend of digital transformation. So we're going to talk a little bit about digital transformation, what that is and what that means to you, why automate your sales tax management, a little bit about cloud versus on-prem um, for tax solutions, but it also will pertain to your ERPs. Why Avalara? Why would you choose us over another provider potentially? And then we'll have time at the end for some questions if anybody has any. And as Alexis mentioned, you can go ahead and enter those in the chat box if you have questions anywhere along the line today. So let's jump into it and talk about the current state of digital transformation. And we're going to start with talking about what exactly is digital transformation? So, I mean, I'm sure there's a there's a whole um, specific definition of this that maybe you've looked up and you can read, but I mean, there are some bullet points here that talk about what digital transformation is at a high level. So it's really the use of technology to, and how it changes your business, how, you, uh, how your business operates, how it performs, and how you deliver more value to your customers. Of course, this means the shift from some of your old manual paper processes and hopefully moving to more automated processes and along that line moving even further upscale into the cloud as opposed to just being just having it you know a, an erp sitting in your in your space um, constantly changing that status quo you know what what can make our business better what can help us grow and that leads into some of the most important pieces which are scalability agility being agile, you know, flexible, all of those things that help your business become ready to grow. So those are kind of the, the high points of what digital transformation is. Now, interestingly enough, there are a lot of businesses out there that have talked about going into that digital transform transformation, pursuing digital transformation. So as you'll see here, there was an IDG report that talks about this, and 89% of is enterprise businesses plan to adopt some sort of digital first strategy strategy but if you look at the combination of the two stats below only 44 percent have taken steps to implement that now this is a little bit different you'll see that 38 percent of enterprise businesses businesses already have them versus 55 percent of startups and the reason that is is because obviously if you're already a current business there's a lot of things that take place there's already business processes that would have to be redefined um, a lot of stakeholders that have to be talked to and and understand what that impact would mean versus a new startup where you get to map that out from the very beginning so startups are of course a lot more successful in this idea of digital transformation and having that that scalable um, business process that that some of you may be striving for already and as you'll see only seven percent of that 89 have actually gotten to a point where they can say they have fully transitioned to the cloud and they have fully completed that digital transformation so if you're one of those people maybe in that 89 percent or maybe you're in the other 11 percent 
that's okay um, because it is obviously something that's just not as easy to execute as it is to talk about. So those are some things you can think about there. Um, and then there are just some additional stats here. And, and one of the things, I'm not gonna read all of, all of the information here, but I do like the quote on the right-hand side that says, within a year, one third of enterprise organizations won't entertain anything other than cloud-only strategy. So, you know, I know that there's, this has been new um, for some of us as we've talked over the years. I mean, I know years ago, they tried to talk about ERP systems going in the cloud and, and I, it kind of shied away and it's come back. And it's very, it's a very different, mindset for people to think about not having their data in that back room, in that server room where they have full control. But it is something that is going to happen regardless at some point. Um, and actually, as we talk about that, public cloud infrastructures suffer 60% fewer security incidents than the old traditional data centers. So where it used to be a fear of people going to the cloud because they weren't really sure about the security of it and not having their data, you know, time has has eased that pain and that we've really gotten to a much better place with our cloud infrastructures and they are quite a bit more secure than than they used to be or than people believe that they might be. And then you'll see here by 2025, which is a few short years away, more than half of enterprise companies will have adopted an all cloud SaaS strategy. So it's just a matter of kind of where are you on that spectrum? Oh, I'm sorry, did I? And then, so we're gonna talk now about um, what does this have to do with sales tax, right? So one of the nice things about Avalara is we've actually been in the cloud for quite a while. We've been in the cloud since we started, but what does it have to do about tax in general is tax is very, very complex. I mean, if you look at all of these numbers, tax is something that's complex and time consuming. This is not something that you wanna be doing as a manual process. And if you are today, boy, I hope you're only in a few states because as you notice some of these numbers, there are 12, thousand jurisdictional rules and if you think about that jurisdictional rules would mean your state local um, county taxes and I mean if you think of having 50 states and there are 12,000 jurisdictional rules that's a lot of different rules in any given state for tax compliance um, millions of different product and service exemptions across those states so something could be exempt in one state and not in another so doing this stuff manually is very time consuming and that's why you know having tax automation is very very key and very important Oops, sorry I went too far ahead I apologize for that so and just to give you an example of that, we talked about some of the product taxability and different items. And this is just gives you this, this screenshot here just shows you some of the differences in specific states. So tree trimming, for example, in California, it, with, or, with lights, it's taxable. Without, it's the labor only. So I mean, there's a lot of different things. Snow removal in the Midwest. I think a lot of us here, I know I'm sitting in Minnesota, you know, there's differences in snow removal on a state by state basis. So I mean, those are all different rules that you would have to maintain within your ERP system if you were doing it manually, you'd have to be managing that. And one of the funniest ones that we come across, well, there's two funny ones on here, the candy bars. Um, some are exempt and some are taxable in various states. We have Indiana here, but actually Minnesota has the same exact um, rules that some of those like a Snickers would be taxable and, and a Kit Kat and a Twix would be exempt. And then in Colorado, I love the one where the cups are exempt in a takeout but straws and lids are not because they're really not necessary. You need the cup to take your beverage out of the restaurant, but you don't really need a straw or cup. So they've decided that those are taxable items. So again, just think about the complexity of, the, complexity of these things and what it would mean to you to do this manually in your system, especially as your business grows. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Some of the other reasons why tax is so complex these days and, and why this, you know, moving to the cloud is so important is back in 2018, this idea of economic nexus was introduced. So if any of you have sat on a webinar or talked with our team, or maybe even talked talk with your tax accountants, you may understand this already. But in 2018, there was a Supreme Court decision that came down in favor of South Dakota in the South Dakota versus Wayfair um, suit that was out there. And basically what they said is, um, now you no longer have to have just a physical presence to have nexus in a state. Just by the sheer fact of selling into a state with, with a certain volume, you could now have what they call economic nexus. And so states really took hold of this and said, okay, well, if you're selling into my state, I'm gonna add legislation as well. So what does this mean? The, the physical presence law is still in effect. So you still have the traditional obligations of tax if you have 
people in a specific state, state or inventory or your physical building, those things are still there, but they're, they're no longer the only requirement. And so some of these states have varying thresholds on when you will then reach an economic threshold in their state. For South Dakota, for example, they've said that if you reach $1,000 in sales or 200 transactions in that state, you now have a nexus obligation in that state because you've reached their economic threshold. And so as you notice the last bullet point here, it's saying your customers are now determining where you collect. If you have an online shopping cart, unless you have a lot of logic written into your shopping cart, you could have people buying your product from anywhere across the country. And your customers then are determining whether or not you have nexus in these states based on where you're shipping products to your customers. So that's been a big pivot over the last almost 18 months. So just some additional things here. When this first started, um, we have some stats here from December 31st of 2018, so just a little over a year ago, 21 states had followed in South Dakota's footsteps and created economic nexus laws. Now, as of December 31st of 2019, one year later, 43 states have enforced economic nexus laws. The only two holdouts right now are Missouri and Florida, but there is legislation that they're likely to adopt coming forward. And so they likely will not be the only holdouts for very long. And of course, if you've done the math on this, there are five what we call nomad states. I'll move to the next slide. New Hampshire, Oregon, Montana, Alaska, and Delaware that have no sales tax. So this is just a graphic depiction of what I just said. January 2019 or December 31st, however you want to look at it. The map on the left are the states that had economic nexus thresholds on their books. And then a year, at the end of the year, a year later, 43 states. So the only two holdouts being Missouri and Florida. So now if you're selling into any of these states, you could potentially have an econ economic nexus obligation in those states. Now, just to take this a little step further, I mentioned um, South Dakota has $100,000 is the threshold, um, but now you'll notice some of these have different things. So Kansas, for example, anytime you make a sale into the state of Kansas, they now have said that they are considered, that's considered a business obligation in that state and you now have nexus. So if you have shipped any sort of product into Kansas in the, in the year 2020 so far, you now have nexus in Kansas and you should be registering, collecting and remitting tax in that state. The other thing you'll notice here is that some of these are and statements and others are or. So Connecticut, for example, their thresholds are $250,000 in sales and $200 in retail sales, whereas Georgia is more, of an, is more of an or statement. The other thing that you really need to pay attention to, and I don't really know kind of the what all of your businesses are, but pay attention because some of these laws laws also allow and mention gross sales. So even if a lot of your customers are exempt, the thresholds could be total sales or gross sales, which means you could still be selling into that state to exempt customers and still be required to register in that state and then file a zero dollar return. And then if you get audited, prove why you didn't collect the tax by maintaining those um, exemption certificates. So many of those laws do say that it's gross sales or total sales and not taxable sales. So for many people who think, oh, this doesn't really affect me, that couldn't be further from the truth in a lot of cases because a lot of exempt um, companies who sell to exempt customers are finding themselves in the middle of audits where they're having to prove why they didn't collect tax and furthermore, why they didn't register in that state. So those are just some things to think about as it comes to why tax is so compliant, so uh, complex, especially now with, with an idea of economic nexus. A couple of other reasons why you might want to automate, and these are just, this is really kind of, you know, summarizing all of the things we said. I mean, accuracy. You want to make sure that the tax that you're collecting and remitting is accurate. And one of the, the main reasons for this, or one of the main examples of this, is if any of you are using any sort of omni-channel, if you're using multiple systems, if, if you have an ERP and a POS or an e-comm system, you want to make sure that you have one source of the truth, that you're collecting the same rate and that you're not off by rounding errors um, based on those different systems. Efficiency. Tax couldn't be more complex right now. 
And the people who are doing this manually are finding that they're spending hours and hours and hours in tax. And how can we make this more efficient and take less time while at the same time reducing risk? Because that's the other big piece of this is what is your tax risk if you choose not to register or if you miss the fact that you have nexus in some states. So these are just some things to think about why automating might be important to your business, not just because it seems fun and flashy, but because it will reduce your risk and make you more efficient, also make your customers more satisfied and all of those good things as well. So this is just information that was based off of a 2019 Tech Validate survey that we did and some of our existing enterprise customers. And this was just some of the things, the top challenges that they faced. And I won't read through all of these, but you'll see a lot of things. The highest one, of course, was just the inability to keep up with the tax laws and, and jurisdictional changes. Watching for those letters in the mail that say, hey, by the way, our tax rate changed by 0.25%. And you need to make sure that you update your ERP system six weeks from now. Um, and that goes down to also the 30%, the continuous maintenance and updates. Difficulty managing exemption certificates. Again, that has become more and more prevalent, especially even with these economic nexus things coming into play. So these are just some of the things out there. Another thing that I wanna mention is other triggers for some of these companies to look at tax automation. So these are challenges they faced, but other things that might make you as a business wanna look at why you might automate your tax. Um, any acquisitions of companies, which actually leads into my next one, launching new products or services. A lot of times with an acquisition, that means you've acquired new products and services, and new products and services mean new tax obligations. And so things like that. Um, if any of you have gone through a sales tax audit, you know the pain, and hopefully it was easy for you, but you know you likely will have another one. And of course, changes in your ERP or adding a shopping cart or a billing system. Those are some of the main things that people um, found were causing them to look at sales tax automation as well. And then, of course, we have the benefits of implementing. And again, I'm not going to read all these percentages. If you if you want them, I'm happy to give them to you. But a lot of those things, accuracy that we talked about, improved reporting. Um, I don't know all of the ERPs you're on. I'm sure you're all on Microsoft is some some in some flavor. But you know, the reporting isn't always the best if you're getting a canned report out of your ERP system. And so having a system that's looking specifically at tax compliance is going to give you improved reporting, which is going to make your filing easier. Um, so that's always a, a real key and benefit to implementing. So let's take a minute and talk about cloud versus on-prem tax solutions and why you would want to move or be in the cloud. And as I mentioned, we've been in the cloud since we started. Um, we do have you know, competitors in both spaces. And as we talk through this little chart real quick, I do want to mention that this really is the same for any of your ERP decisions as well. If you're considering um, an ERP move, I mean, these are some things that you might want to think about as well. So of course, you've got a subscription-based model in the, in, when you're in a cloud versus having to get a capital expenditure approved. So that long-term investment versus you know, kind of having that, that monthly um, that monthly fee in a subscription model, model or annual fee, if you will. Also, implementation can be a lot more complex and take a lot longer when you're in an on-prem solution. Um, there's not as much that can be deployed directly to you from the cloud, whereas a lot of times with cloud-based solutions, they're faster, easier to deploy. There's a lot of stuff set up, and it transmits from company A to company B to company C much easier as well. Um, system integrations, I mean, when you have a cloud-based solution, we've just we've just found and proven that it's easier to connect to more ERPs, accounting systems, e-com systems, POS, is all of that good stuff, versus if you have a canned on-prem solution, sometimes that may have to be custom integrations that are written. And then, and then of course, there's the global, um, that capability, so I don't know if any of you are, are in the global business as well, but there can be differences there in terms of what, which, which side will support that and GST and other cross-border functionality as well. So those are, some those are some things to think about as you look at cloud versus on-prem. And I'm sure many of you, if you've ever evaluated, have thought about this, especially when it comes to the first two pieces already. And there's just a little quote here um, that says, when digital transformation is done right, it's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But when it's done wrong, all you have is a really fast caterpillar. So I thought that was cute. I thought I would add that in there, um, especially as we're approaching spring and, and uh, we're hoping to see some butterflies soon. So I thought that that was kind of a cute wrap up to that section. So of course, we want to talk about why we're here and why Avalara and 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 why, we, why you'd want to look at us as opposed to the others. And um, 
there is a IVC marketscape report that um, I've referenced in some of my other numbers as well. But one of the big things that we have is um, the fact that we integrate with so many ERPs and e-commerce systems. You'll see there's a little chart on the right-hand side that talks about some of the integrations and where we sit, but we do have a lot of different integrations that I'll talk about in a minute. But there are some other things here too and why you would choose Avalara. And of course, we've already talked about the need and want to improve accuracy in your sales tax cal calculations, reducing risk, um, the, the freedom that it will give you to add those new products and services if you've ever held back and to move into new geographies. Um, the other thing to think about if any of you are, are in the manufacturing industry, we've seen some manufacturers too that have started taking their excess stock and selling it and all of a sudden they've become distributors and didn't really realize it. And so it's a really quick um, change to be able to do that within an automated system to say, well, now I'm selling this and this customer is not exempt and I already have my product taxability in there. So it becomes, it becomes really easy to make that switch if you start selling any of your excess product. Um, make my slide move here too. And so as we talked about, here are some other things, the, the number of integrations, I've talked about this kind of broad sweeping in the past, but I, I didn't wanna say this number because it's a really large number, 700 pre-built integrations. So what does that mean for you? If any of you are currently sitting on Dynamics GP and you're looking at moving to D365 BC or finance and operations, that move is gonna be very seamless for you because we integrate with all of those products. So we integrate with all of the Microsoft suites. So as you look at moving and enhancing your ERP system, we can move with you. Additionally, if you decide that you wanna add, um, as I've talked about an e-com or a POS system to your environment, we have connectors for those as well. So what that means, as I talked about earlier, is that one source of the truth where you can sell product out of multiple systems in your environment and get the same tax calculation in the back end. And you don't have to worry about rounding issues or, hey, why was it this in my shopping cart? But now when I push it down to my ERP, it's changed by, you know, 45 cents. You won't have to worry about that because we have connectors into 700 products. And if any of you guys have any of those old homegrown systems or something that is being maintained that you really love, we also have an API for that that can be used. We are designed for global commerce. We do handle VAT and we handle um, multi-country uh, multi taxation. And one of the big things that we're doing this year as a company is we're focusing even more on global. We want to be the leading name in tax and we've come very close in the US. We're very proud of our brand. We wanna really become that um, in a global market as well, largely because a lot of our existing customers and the people we're looking at are expanding their business as well. You guys may be now playing in a global market where maybe you weren't a few years ago. So we wanna make sure that we can take care of, of that global piece for you as well. We've got some numbers in terms of, of the battle tested section, 6.7 billion transactions run. We also have a lot of information that we share around Black Friday. Um, and Cyber Week that we can talk about the, the volume of transactions that we are sending through for our customers. And we're, we're really proud of those numbers. So if any of you ever want to see some of that information, we have that. But more than anything, we want you to have peace of mind. We want you to feel that, that the products are reliable, that you guys have less concern and you can go on doing all of those other things that you're used to doing in your business or that need to be taken care of in your business. And so leading into that, you know, what does that mean for you? Well, you're likely, um, you know, you're gonna have a lot more time on your hand. You're gonna be required to collect and remit sales tax in more states now with this, but we're gonna make it a lot easier for you. One of the other things I'll talk about in another slide is we've talked about collecting and remitting in these states, but you're gonna have this obligation now to, to actually do those sales tax returns. And who's gonna do those? I mean, if you think of the person and maybe it's you, filing those returns right now, and maybe you're in one state or three states, now you may be moving to 13. That's a lot of time and energy put out there. And so that means you need to have those that good reporting that we talked about. How do you get the information? You have to take the time. So we're gonna hopefully make this a lot easier for you. So I do wanna talk briefly about the solution as a whole and what this looks like. And some of you maybe have seen this before, but we do have a team of people sitting in our offices that are constantly in contact with state and local governments to update our cloud solution with the latest information on tax rate, product taxability, jurisdictional boundaries should those change, so that all of that stuff is held and maintained in the cloud. 
if you move to Avalara, you will never again have to look at those letters that come out to you saying this rate is changing on July 1st, because you will know that that's just already going to be taken care of from our team of people. We will integrate then to your systems, and we already talked about this, your ERP, your POS, your, your e-com systems. And when you run a transaction, it's going to go look at your profile, and you'll have a profile in an Avalara, Avalara user portal, and it's going to say, is this customer tax or taxable or exempt? Yes or no. Is this product taxable? Yes or no. If so, what is the rate? And it's going to return that rate back down to your ERP system in four tenths of a second. And, and that's sometimes why a demo of the product is a little bit underwhelming in terms of that piece, the transactional piece, because there's nothing to see. You enter a transaction, you save, and then it comes back with a tax rate or zero. So that all is happening very, very seamlessly. But we will integrate with our cert capture piece. And I did talk a couple of times about exemption certificates and how important it is to manage exemption certificates. I would be willing to guess if many of you don't have an automated tax solution today, you are storing your exemption certificates likely in a file cabinet. And um, I'm sure if any of you have gone through an audit, one of the first things that auditor is going to ask you for when they come in is they're going to say, show me your exempt sales. And you're going to pull that report for them. And then they're going to ask you to go pull some exemption certificates. And if you can't find those for those, vent for those customers, for those sales, they can start assessing fines and penalties on that and assuming that you should have charged tax. So exemption certificate management is very key. Now, one of the things that I do want to talk about really quickly is if exemption certificates are a very small piece of your business, um, Avatax, our Avatax product does have what we would call a cert capture light. It's Avatax exemptions, where it would handle somewhere around 100 or so exemptions. So if you're just managing a few exemptions, that can be done in our core Avatax product. But if your business model is requiring, requiring you to collect hundreds of thousands of exemption certificates, then you probably want to look at cert capture because that will not only manage them, but it'll also help you to understand when they're expiring. You can send out bulk notifications asking for them to be updated. So you can send a batch out for anybody whose exemption certificate might be expiring in the next six months and ask for them to be resubmitted electronically. And then that will, of course, integrate with Avatax and your billing system to tell if the customer is exempt or not. And then finally, we can also manage the returns that we talked about. We talked about that complexity as you move into more and more states where the forms are not all going to be the same. And so um, that can become very, very time consuming in how you manage those. If you choose to use Avalara returns, you would simply go into your portal, look at any of the returns, and we have a great monitor that would show you if that specific state or return is due annually, quarterly, biannually. And you can go in and look at that and it'll tell you it's ready and you can approve it we will swipe the funds and we'll go ahead and make that file that return for you. And we'll manage all of the state notifications on the returns as well. So that piece can be taken care of. It's very easy. Now, these products do not have to be used together. They can be used independently. So you, if you're just somebody who just is tired of doing returns, we can do returns without either of the other products or we can use just cert capture. So you don't have to buy these as a suite, but of course they work really well together. Um, one last thing, and I do not have a slide on this, but I want to talk briefly about our, the SST program. And if we were in a room, I would probably ask for a show of hands on how many of you know what the SST program is. But SST stands for Streamlined Sales Tax. And we are part of that program. We are one of the certified um, tax providers in, in the SST program. We're one of only about five certified providers. There are 20... Um, I'm going to get the number wrong now, 23 states, I believe, that are part of the SST organization. And what this means is those states have, have formed a coalition to make tax a little bit easier among that group of states. They've tried to define things in a similar fashion, um, define requ um, filing requirements, define product taxability. They have not made it to the point yet where they've made all the taxes the same, but they've tried to define things a little bit easier. With us being a certified um, provider in the SST program, if you happen to be a company who, um, who has now economic nexus in a state where you don't have physical nexus, so let's take Kansas. You had no other reason before today to file in Kansas, and, um, and now you've sold into that state, so you would have an economic nexus in that state. 
it, since we're an SST provider, since we're a certified provider, you could actually have some of those transactional fees and return filing done at no expense to you because the SST program will pay us to do that for you in some of those states where you're considered a voluntary um, remitter in that state. So if you already have a physical nexus in that state and you're required to remit in that state, you don't qualify, you're considered a non-voluntary um, remitter in that state. But if you're a voluntary remitter in any of those states, some of these products and services can come to you at a discounted rate. So if it's something that you've, you've been concerned about before, you know you have nexus obligations, but you are concerned about the cost, make sure to talk to our team about the SST program and what that could mean for you. So I want to wrap up um, with just a couple of slides here. We do have a all things tax conference coming up in May in St. Louis. Um, for any of you that are just ready to geek out about tax, we have two fun filled days of speakers and information all about sales tax. It's our fifth annual crush event. Um, as of right now, just in case anybody's thinking or raising their hand already, um, we are still planning and continuing 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 with the event as of today. I know there's a lot of concern about travel these days, um, but there is information if you go to avalara.crush or avalaracrush.com, you can get information on the event and, and get kind of some of the information on sessions that are available to you and why you might want to attend. There actually is too, if this really is something interesting to you, the bottom of the page, there is a, an actual letter that you can present to your leadership on why you should attend Crush and all of the benefits to you um, including um, CPE credit and things like that that we're offering. So just something to think about, avaleracrush.com. And finally, we do have over 20,000 customers across all different industries using our products. And, you know, it's we, we like to liken ourselves at times to payroll. Many times once people go to automating payroll, they very seldom say, hey, you know, I think I'm going to take payroll back in-house because I just have extra time to do it now. Um, tax is very similar. You know, many people are doing it today because they've always done it. Once you outsource it, I, I highly doubt you will ever decide to take it back in house. It is just too much work and too much effort and you all have more important things to do than managing sales tax compliance in your spare time. So this is just a, a quick sampling of some of the customers that we have. So with that, I'm going to leave it open to a Q&A if any of you have entered questions in the box. I'm also going to move forward one more slide. I've got my contact information here. Should any of you have questions or concerns, um, please feel free to reach out to me or reach out to your Columbus rep. Um, I know many of them very personally, so if, if you, know, you have questions, you can certainly talk to them and they'll get in touch with me. But are there any questions? Hi, Stacy. So I do see a couple questions here. First one, uh, do I have to do business in all SST states in order to qualify for the program? It's a great question and no, um, you do not. So you can actually work in one of them or multiple and it would just depend on you know what where that value is, but no, you do not have to be in all of them. Okay, and I have another question here. Do I need to change anything to my ERP to use Evalara? Right, so the, so the change in your ERP would be very minimal. I'm gonna use GP because I'm an old time GP girl. Um, some of the other ones are the same. You know, you likely have your tax details and your tax schedules all set up. The real easy change that you're gonna make is you're gonna create a tax detail called Avalara and you're gonna put that on all of your products and customers. That's actually what triggers a call up to your system. Beyond that, your day-to-day -day process will not change. Like I said, you'll enter a transaction, it, it's gonna go up and read your profile which of course you'll have to spend a little time setting that information up as a standard implementation, but your general day-to-day -day processes will not change and, and everything you have set up in your ERP, it's basically gonna be just that tax detail that you're gonna change. All right, great. If there are no additional questions, I would like to thank you all for attending today's presentation. And thank you, Stacy, for giving us a great overview of tax tools and tips for Microsoft Dynamics. I apologize. Can I just mention too that we did oh, offer sure. we did offer that a gift card for those that are registering. We will be contacting the winner when we get the list of, of attendees. So we will be contacting the winner via email to let you know if you won the gift card. And I do a thank you all for um, attending and thank you, Alexis, for having us. All right. Thanks again, Stacy. Have a great yep. rest of your day, everyone.